Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. The McKinsey Global Institute did a study where they identified in America there had been nine uh, recessions since World War II. So the economy hit bottom and then rebounded to hit the prior peak economically. And then there's always a lag between when the economy and, and the, the economics of the recovery hit the prior peak. And then there's a lag for when the employment hits that prior peak. And as you can see here, for the first six of the nine recessions, it took about six months on average to get to the prior employment peak. But we had a recession in the early 90s where it took our economy 15 months to get to the employment peak. And then 2001, 2002, it took us 39 months to get to the prior peak. And when they did the study, we didn't know the answer uh, in the current recovery, and we still don't know the answer, because in America it's taken us 70 months, and we're still nowhere near the prior peak of uh, employment. And there clearly is something that's gone wrong in our economy. We have, as we've described there, jobless recoveries. And that, that wasn't the case 20 and 30 years ago. And so this is my sense for what's going on. There are three types of innovations in the world. And the reason why in my puzzling of this question I'm focusing on innovation is innovation is the target of of investment. And investment is the fuel that keeps the economy going in one way or another. So the first type of investment we call an empowering innovation. And what we mean by an empowering innovation is it transforms products that are simple and affordable from things that previously were complicated and expensive. And you'll see here that I, I have three concentric circles. And what they're made to represent the centermost circle. Those are customers in a market that have the most money. And then as you come to larger circles, they represent larger populations of people who have less money and less skill. And a good example of this kind of empowering innovation would be the mainframe computer. The mainframes cost $2 million. Not very many people could have a computer. And then the personal computer reduced the cost from $2 million to $2,000. And so most of us could own and use a computer. And now the smartphone for $200 enables billions of people around the world to have a computer. And in a similar way, when the automobile was developed. Originally, they were a toy of the rich. But Henry Ford and the Model T made a car so affordable and accessible that millions and millions of people can have it. From our study, I will assert that nearly all of the jobs in an economy are created by empowering innovations. And the reason is, is very simple. If you make it affordable and accessible, more people buy them, more people use them. You have to hire people to make them and distribute them and sell them and service them and so on. Empowering innovations use capital because anytime you start a new business, you need capital on the balance sheet. But this is the first type of innovation for the purpose of the issue tonight. Then the second type of innovation we call sustaining innovations. And sustaining innovations make good products better. 
And when you just look at the world, most of the innovations that we see are sustaining innovations that make good products better. They have a different effect on the economy, however, in that sustaining innovations create few, if any, jobs. And they're kind of a neutral as it relates to capital. And the reason why sustaining innovations don't create a lot of jobs is when you sell a better product, the customer, they don't buy the old product. Uh, Toyota developed a marvelous uh, hybrid, car, hybrid car called a Prius, but whenever they successfully sell a Prius, they don't sell a Camry. And by their very nature, sustaining innovations are replacative in character, and that's why they don't create a lot of jobs. And then the third type of innovation we call efficiency innovations. Efficiency innovations allow you to make the same products at lower prices to sell to the same customers. So in America, we have a beautiful uh, online insurance company called Geico. Same products, 15% lower price. Um, Walmart is an efficiency innovation. They, they can sell the same products to the same customers at 15% lower uh, prices. And efficiency innovations also are very critical to the economy. If we don't have them, then whole economies would, would be blown out of the water. But they reduce jobs by their very nature. So uh, in America, over and over again, you see this. If, if Mar uh, Walmart is going into a, a town, a as they build their store, they hire a lot of people, but in aggregate, uh, generally there are about 15% fewer jobs in that area in retailing when they have done their work. But inter interestingly, efficiency innovations free capital. And what I mean by that, by illustration, is before Toyota came to America, it took the American car companies about 60 days to assemble a car. And as the car crawled through this plant, there had to be a lot of work in process inventory on the balance sheet to support that process. Toyota figured out how to assemble a car in two and a half days. And because it zipped through the process, they didn't need to have nearly as much um, work in process inventory on the balance sheet and it essentially took capital that had been imprisoned on the balance sheet and it freed it up to do remarkable things. And so it's kind of a neat, uh, almost like a perpetual motion machine. As long as we create more jobs through empowering innovations than efficiency innovations reduce, and as long as the capital that's created by efficiency innovations create enough capital to fund empowering innovations. It just keeps going and going. And in fact, in America for the first six recessions, this seems to work well. And just almost like clockwork, re reset itself. But then we've, something has gone wrong. And my sense of what's gone wrong is right here Finance has cut this circle and uh, created a system where there's a beginning and an end, essentially. And really what finance is causing us to do is take efficiency innovations and reinvest in efficiency innovations over time. There's a theory is a very important element in everything that we do. And finance has a really strong theory associated with it. And uh, part of it is an observation that uh, the shareholders are important. Part of it comes from calculus. You have to have something to minimize or maximize or calculus isn't very worthwhile. Uh, and uh, Friedman gave us this assertion 
the, the, the role of management is to maximize returns to capital, or to the shareholders. And, uh, and he solved the problem of mathematics needs something to optimize, and so it was assumed that that's what finance was about. Then, in addition to having a really powerful theory set, there are tools that are available for finance. And I want to assert that the development of the spreadsheet by Dan Brickman at the Harvard Business School um, had a bigger impact on management than almost anything in the last hundred years. Because I, I remember when I was an MBA student at Harvard, they taught me how to calculate internal rate of return. And I had a four function calculator in the mid 70s and I had a pencil and a sheet of paper and we had to work out the pro, pro formas and then I remember I clicked e e e equate and I came up with an internal rate of return that clearly was not right and, and it was just so difficult that we had a concept internal rate of return but uh, we really couldn't use it per se. And thank goodness for these spreadsheets, because you could build a model of a company and then test, well, if I change this input or this assumption, what will the impact be on internal rate of return or um, return on net assets or whatever? And, uh, and, and it, it had a huge impact, as you'll see. Then uh, finance really has become a profession, not just a job. And, uh, and then it's led by powerful people, intellectually. And it's, it's just, a, of its own, finance is a machine. The impact that this has had is that um, now a 26-year-old analyst who has a spreadsheet can figure out what inputs need to be at what levels to get what outputs that they're going to use to measure whether the management is being successful or not. And so you have this odd situation where somebody who has never run a company sits across the, te the desk from a manager and s tells them how to run the company. And it's interesting that the managers obey the commandments that finance gives to them. Increasingly, Finance takes charge of how the economy works. Now, there's a really smart economist named George Gilder, and he made an assertion that if you get all of the inputs that are required to make an output, a product or service that you're going to sell, some of these inputs are going to be very abundant and cheap, like sand. And things that are abundant and cheap, you don't have to worry about them. You don't have to account for them in any way. But he points out that other types of innovations are scarce and costly. And things that are costly and scarce, you've got to really watch them and husband their use and deploy them only in places in the market where they'll yield the highest return for the use of these, abund uh, these scarce resources. Well, as this juggernaut of finance emerged, because of their power, they observed that capital through the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s was, uh, was scarce and very costly. And therefore, that's what we ought to measure, is are we deploying capital in applications that yield the highest return? And an interesting thing that finance has done to managers is they've given them options. So before all of this happened, the way a manager measured profitability was with crude measures, like tons of cash. And now finance has given managers ratios. And this sophistication gives them options. So for example, the third one there, internal rate of return, is a common measure. It's a ratio. 
And the numerator is profit. The denominator is speed. And so I can get internal rate of return up in one of two ways. Make more profit through innovation or only invest in projects that pay off very short term. Either way, get internal rate of return up. And so finance brought to management this logic and the language of ratios. So what impact has that then had on this uh, on this process. Well, you create more capital through efficiency innovations. And then the analysts have to think, gosh, we got capital, where should we deploy it? And by using these ratios, they realize, gosh, the problem with empowering innovations is those things pay off in five to 10 years. And we'd actually have to take capital and stick it back on the balance sheet. On the other hand, if we took that same capital because of these commandments and, and recycle it back in efficiency innovations, the great thing about efficiency innovations is they pay off in a year or two. And instead of using capital, they create more capital. What a deal. And so they reinvest in efficiency innovations. More money comes out. And then they say, geez, I wonder what we should do with this capital. We just do one and, and over again. And still in America's economy, there is still a little bit of capital that goes up into empowering innovations. But my sense is that over the last 20 years, the number of uh, empowering innovations that our economy is generating is about a third the level that it was in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. What we see here is that private equity shops and hedge funds just complain that there is so much money chasing few, so few deals and entrepreneurs complaining that they can't get funding. And what's happening in our economy is because of this recycling of capital into capital, we are awash in capital. And uh, the cost of capital is nearly zero. And yet we can't create new jobs because the financing mechanism hijacks capital and recycles it into itself. And where is this heading is an interesting question. Through the, remember, during the 1960s, 70s, and the early 80s, Japan's economy was just a juggernaut. Japan was growing at unprecedented rates in the world. And they transformed themselves from poverty into prosperity in about 25 years. What is it that was the engine of Japan's miracle? It was that they, in my language, they disrupted America through empowering innovations. So, for example, Toyota um, made a car that was so affordable that the low end of humanity, people we call teenagers today, could own a car. Do you remember what Sony did? They made rusty little um, pocket radios that cost $2 that made millions of people, and they enabled them to have uh, music wherever they went. And Canon um, made a printer so affordable and accessible that we could have one in every office and every home. And because of these empowering innovations, billions of people around the world had access to these products by companies made in Japan. And for 30 years, their unemployment rate was less than 2%. If you were alive, you had a job. But starting in the late 1980s, the successful uh, Japanese companies started to hire graduates of business schools in the West who brought with them this logic of how to measure investments and to how to guide things 
in ways that maximize return on net assets and internal rate of return. And my sense, I think I'm right, is that since 1990, Japan's economy has generated only one empowering innovation, and that is the Nintendo Wii. It's the only one. And their economy has been dead or flat for 23 years. They are awash in capital. The cost of capital is zero, and they just can't get out of it. And I think that capital isn't the problem. The problem is the way we calculate success makes it impossible for innovators to invest in the kind of things that create jobs. And so we have um, recoveries without, without jobs. The, the jobless recovery that you illustrated at the beginning, and uh, it's been a similar sort of story in the, in the UK. Here, I don't know about America, it's leading to a lot of political calls for redistribution and a different role for the state. If, if, this, if this theory is, is, is correct, redistribution alone won't lead to a rekindling of that, of that cycle. Do you, have a, do you have a sense of... You're, you're exactly right, Rohan. So um, I, I think the Republicans and the Democrats are both wrong on this redistribution issue. So in America, the top 1% own actually about 28% of the disposable income. Right. And the Republicans say you have to allow these people to keep their money because they're the ones that invest in jobs. And that's actually not true. A few of them invest to create jobs. Most of them use their capital to make more capital. Right. And, uh, but then the Democrats, I think, are wrong as well, in that if you don't have any empowering innovations emerging in America, and you give people some of their money for, to, to spend, they'll invest it on sustaining innovations, because that's all that's available. Mm. And by their very nature, it doesn't create jobs. So it's just, it's just like um, flooding the economy with more capital doesn't solve the capital problem. Mm. And redistribution doesn't solve the job problem. It really is empowering innovations. Yeah. Just on empowering innovations, I thought your point about efficiency innovations, kind of emancipating capital is important. I wonder whether they it can in emancipate intellectual property as well, which might be leveraged elsewhere. And Isn't that interesting? And then maybe the other thing that would be interesting to think about would be, you know, an empowering innovation. We, we're talking about them as products often, but it strikes me they may, through technology, more often be platforms now mm -hmm, than products. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I think we've seen that with Apple, where they kind of maybe employ less people than you would imagine to create that many apps and actually the employment's external. And then I wonder if it could include services as well. So, and sometimes whether these solutions could be services. So venture capital could plug this gap more and drive empowering innovations. And maybe they themselves, the venture capitalists can act as, they are empowering innovations, they're supporting yeah. it, and they yeah. are that process, that alternative finance, maybe crowdfunding in the future, can be yeah. the empowering innovation itself. Is that yeah. Product and service is the wrong way to categorize things. Uh, in America, and I think you guys saw it before we did, the ability to learn online has created an extraordinary boom in that market. And it's because some of them are sustaining innovations. You can teach physics 101 better online than you can in most physical classrooms. But most of it is in empowering innovations. It enables many more people to learn many more things at lower prices. And it's created um, really exciting jobs.